Okay, good morning. Welcome back. Uh, we're going to have two lectures on probability this week and then another lecture next week on randomized algorithms. So this will be a topic that will occupy us for a few classes. Uh, maybe you've seen some probability before, but we're going to start from the beginning, especially because uh, we do it a little bit differently than you see in most probability textbooks, but I think it's a better approach to learning probability. So let me take you back to the origins of probability, which we can actually pinpoint. It's way back in France in the 17th century. There was a fellow called uh, Chevalier de Marais. Uh, There's actually not a photo of him, or a, well, it's definitely not a photo of him. It's not a drawing of him either. Uh, as far as I can tell, you cannot find any likeness of him at all. So I just picked a guy that I thought looked like a French guy from 1654. <laughs> um, and actually, you read a lot about this person if you read about the history of probability. What they don't always tell you is, um, you know, he looks like a nobleman or something. It was just a dude called Antoine that, um, you know, wrote novels. And like his hero, who's like an obvious stand-in for himself, was this smart guy called Chevalier de Marais. And then after a while, his friends just started calling him by that name of his character. Uh, anyway, he made his money mainly by gambling. Um, and for a while, he would uh, have the following gambling game with people where he would roll a regular die with six sides, and he's like, I'll roll it four times, I'll win if I get a one, and if I don't get a one, then you win. And he played it for even stakes. Um, so would you play that game with him? No? Oh, that's a very uh, quick answer. Um, well, I guess most people thought, well, you know, there's a one in six chance that it'll come up a one, and, you know, he's only taking four chances, so it seems like a good deal. Um, it's, totally not it's not clear what Mary thought. Some people said that he thought, well, um, you know, it's a one in six chance, but I have four chances, so four over six is two thirds, so that's a good deal for me. Uh, I'm not sure if that's what he really thought, but that's also not correct. Um, but, uh, you know, after a while, people caught on to this, like you did, and uh, people stopped making this bet with him, so he lost his source of income. <laughs> so he was like, let's, you know, add some pizzazz to it, let's step it up and see if I can get some more uh, takers. So he made a new bet where he said, okay, I'm going to roll two dice, and each time I'll see if I got double ones, and I'm going to do it 24 times, and I'll win if I get double ones once. Uh, there's a term for double ones in gambling. Do you know what it is? Yeah, everybody always knows this. You guys are like not snake eyes. It's, a, it's also an animal term. Um, yeah, he, he rolls two dice to try and get double ones, and his reasoning was, you know, the probability of getting two ones when you roll two dice is one-sixth the probability of getting one one when you roll one die, which is correct. So he thought to make up for the rolls of the four rolls that we did before, I'll like multiply it by six and do it 24 times. So that was his game. Would you take this one? No? Okay, well, we'll think about this. I mean, now you see it gets a little tricky to think about, and that's what we're here for, to learn about probability. Um, yeah, after a while, he played this a lot, and he started losing money, and he got pretty mad. Um, but he thought he was pretty good at math, which is not so true. Um, <laughs> but he knew a lot of smart people, so, I mean, he, he actually wrote to his friend, or actually talked to his friend, they were both in Paris. Uh, oh, I forgot this story, but anyway, he eventually got a professional mathematician to assist him. He asked one more question, actually, this is the most famous problem in the history of probability, in the subject of history of probability. Uh, he was curious about this one too. So they imagined playing this like very exciting game where two people competed and there'd just be a coin flip and like Alice would get a point if it was heads and Bob would get a point if it was tails. And it was like first one to four points wins. That was their idea of a fun gambling game. And uh, he said, imagine like Alice and Bob are playing and Alice is winning 3-2 and then like the police come and you have to stop the game. Uh, how should they split up the wager? I mean, you know, they could just take their money back, 50-50 each, but that doesn't seem fair because Alice is winning. But, you know, it's not like Alice should get all the money because she hadn't won yet, so what would be a reasonable way to split it up? This was like a serious question that interested him. Uh, this is called the problem of points. And so anyway, uh, he thought about it, he couldn't figure it out. So he wrote, he talked to his friend Pascal, who was actually a really good mathematician. And Pascal didn't talk to him, but he talked to Fermat by correspondence, who was actually a lawyer, but also a very good mathematician. So they wrote a bunch of letters about these problems back and forth to one another. And this is actually how probability theory was born. I mean, this was literally when, you know, mathematicians first started to analyze probability theory. Um, 
because of this other guy, Mary. So the moral of the story, you know, usually when you like learn probability in class, you're like, okay, you learn all this like formulas and stuff, and then you can, as an exercise, apply it to try to help you win at poker or something. Um, but it's not like analyzing gambling as a side benefit of probability. It's actually the whole original motivation for probability was to analyze gambling. However, this class is not called Great Theoretical Ideas in Gambling. It's called Great Theoretical Ideas in Computer Science. And um, I would like to tell you, I alluded to this a little bit before, I'd like to tell you a little bit of a computer science perspective on probability, because that's the one I would like you to take in this class. <coughs> okay, so this is how I think about it, and how I think you should think about it too. Probability theory, you should really think about it as the mathematics of analyzing computer code or programs that have random number generator calls in them. That's how you should think of all of probability theory. So let me give you an example. If you like open up like a basic textbook in probability, they'll start telling you a story like Mary throws like four six-sided dice. But in this class, you should immediately think, okay, that means this. I mean, that's just like a story to tell about this piece of random code. Or, you know, die one through die four are set to this function call, which you should think of as returning a random integer between one, two, three, four, five, or six with equal probability. Or, you know, if it says Marais rolls an eight-sided die and a three-sided die, um, well, actually, I mean, um, in real life, normally if you say a die, right, that's uh, six-sided, but there are actually in real life dice of different side, a number of sides, like eight or three. Uh, in any case, in probability, you eventually start referring to like k-sided dice for any value of k, and you just assume that these exist. Um, I should also add that like one of these objects is called a die, and if you have more than one object, it's called dice. <laughs> anyway, coming back to the, the story, you know, if you see a little story like this, you should immediately, again, translate it into your mind into some computer code that looks like this, like a simulation of what the story is actually about. Okay, because, I mean, this is uh, you know, very rigorous, and this is just some English sentence. So in probability theory, they define a notion called an experiment which has some fishy definition like it's like a physical process that generates a random outcome or something. But for us, it just means a block of code that has some random number generator calls in it. You know, if you see something that looks like this, you know, a patient has a 10% chance of having some disease and then the probability problem would go on from there. You know, again, just you can say, all right, let's pick a random number between one and 10. If it's one, we'll say they have the disease. Otherwise, they don't have the disease. Now this kind of thing is a little bit annoying, like if this was like 11%, then maybe you would pick a number between 1 and 100 and see if it's less than or equal to 11. That's a little bit weird. So, so far I've only talked about this kind of random number generator that generates a number between 1 and some k. But I'm going to tell you another one that's called um, a Bernoulli random number. Uh, looks like it's another French person. Actually, he was Swiss, though. Um, and Bernoulli, you should think of this as a random number generator that takes in one input, p, which is a number between 0 and 1, and it returns 1 with probability p and 0 with probability 1 minus p. Okay, so this is a funny name, but you're going to have to get used to it. Bernoulli is this random number generator that returns 0 or 1 with a specified probability. Okay. And one more thing I'll say on this subject, let's say you have a sentence like this, Anton flips uh, two fair coins. Um, we can use this Bernoulli generator to flip these coins. We can pass it the parameter a half, so it returns one with probability a half and zero with probability a half. That's like flipping a coin. And we're going to sort of stop paying attention to the difference between like heads and tails and zero and one. It's kind of the same thing, it's just a convention. So um, I might say flip a coin and have in my mind that it should be zero or one. You could add a little statement like this if you want, like if it comes up zero, call that heads, if it comes up one, call that tails, but we'll uh, sort of stop worrying about this detail. Okay, so just to summarize, uh, whenever we're doing probability in this class, you know, if we start with a problem that's not about code, then you should translate it into a problem that's about code. And then, you know, the code that we analyze can have these two kinds of random number generators, rand int m, which returns 1, 2, 3 up to m with probability 1 over m each, or Bernoulli p, which returns 1 with probability p. Now, if you're used to you know, doing coding with your favorite programming language, 
you may find or think that it has a, um, another kind of random number generator that maybe generates a random real number between 0 and 1. And uh, this is not allowed in this course. Um, first of all, actually, in real life, it cannot actually do this, right? Because real numbers have infinitely many digits, and they cannot be stored on a computer. So it's obviously not quite doing a random real number between 0 and 1. But um, also, just doing the analysis when you have such random number generators is surprisingly tricky. So I mean, it's just not allowed. We, we will not talk about it in this class. OK, so these are the two random number generators that we, we will talk about. Any questions so far? No? <clears throat> OK. All right, so let's talk about how you can analyze such random code, such experiments. So again, this is like the sentence that you might see, or the first few sentences you might see in a probability problem in like an elementary probability textbook. Let's say Mary flips a coin, a fair coin, that means it's 50-50. And if it's heads, she rolls a three-sided die. And if it's tail, she rolls a four-sided die. OK, we haven't got to even like a problem yet. It's just the description of like the start of a problem. But this describes an experiment. And the first step is always, you know, let's get rid of this English language words and translate it into code. OK, so this would be the code for this. You know, flip is a Bernoulli half, so that's 50-50, uh, let's say 0 or 1. Or you can think of it as heads and tails. And then if it's 0, you do a, set the die to be randint 1 to 3. Otherwise, you set it to be randint 1 to 4. OK, so going from here to here is not really like a mathematical exercise. It's some kind of natural language understanding exercise. But uh, once we get to here, then everything is going to be mathematics. And that's what I want to tell you about going ahead, how to analyze such random code. OK, so the next step I want you to do, if you're ever doing very elementary probability problem, is to draw what I'm going to call a probability tree, which is not like a standard concept, but it's what I would like you to do in, in 251 if you have such problems. Um, so what does that mean? So I hope you can still read this little bit of code that we're going to analyze. So in a probability tree, I'll illustrate it with an example. But you have a sort of branching in the tree for each line which calls a random number generator. So I'll try to illustrate it by an example. If you trace through this code, the first thing that happens is it calls this Bernoulli half. Okay? So you can put that at the top of your probability tree. And you have a branch for each outcome that it might return, you know, heads or tails. Okay? And then you have to keep going through the tree, and you have to keep tracing through what happens in the code depending on what the return value of the previous calls were. OK, so you see like if the coin comes up heads, then the next thing you do is this randint 3. OK, so you put that here. And if it, at that point, it has three possible return values, 1, 2, or 3. So you draw those in as well. And then for each of these return values, 1, 2, or 3, if you finish tracing through the code, like it ends. So that's the end. And similarly, if it came up tails, the coin flip, then you do this line. You do a randint 4. It has four possible you know, return values. So you put a branch for each of those. And then if you finish tracing through the code, it's done. So this is sort of the end of drawing the tree part of the probability tree. Um, you can stop me if you have any questions. Now, the next thing you should do if you're really carefully analyzing this code is you label each of the leaves of the tree, of which there are seven here, with what's called the outcome. And I'll say it more carefully later, but the outcome of a, a leaf is just a list of all the like, return values along that path. So it's a list of all the random number generator outputs along that path. So here it's heads 1, here it's heads 2, heads 3, tails 1, tails 2, tails 3, tails 4. OK, and these seven objects are called the outcomes of the experiment. You think of it as like possible outcomes. And the last thing you should do is label each of these outcomes with its probability. And I'm just going to say its probability is defined to be like the probability associated with, you multiply all the probabilities associated with the path down to that leaf. OK, so for example, if we look at this heads one outcome, it's this path. This heads had probability a half, and this one had probability a third. So it's a half times a third, which is a sixth. OK, and these actually all have a sixth. They're all a half times a third. And what does this outcome have probability? That was not really a really good English sentence. What is the probability of this outcome? One eighth, yeah. Because it's half for this and a quarter for this. 
OK, so now you have sort of, at this point, drawn the whole probability tree and annotated it fully. OK, so you have an al all the outcomes written down and their, all their probabilities. And um, we'll see that, uh, well, you can kind of see that these will always be non-negative numbers that add up to 1. You know, because it's sort of like you're, each time you do a random number generator, it's like kind of uh, breaking up like, the space into fractions. You know. Imagine like you do this coin flip, and then the universe splits into like two universes, one where it became heads and one where it became tails. So at this point, like half of the universes have heads, half of them have tails. And then you get three more universes here, and like a sixth of all the universes here have heads one, and so forth. OK. So let me recap some of the definitions that we saw there. So an outcome, that's like a technical term. It means a leaf in the probability tree exactly what it means. Or in other words, it's like um, a sequence of values that might occur when you do all the random number of generator calls in one trace through some code. Uh, the sample space, this is another probability term. It's just a set. It's the set of all outcomes. So in the previous example, it was this set, which has seven items in it, the seven outcomes, heads one through tails four. And these probabilities, you know, each outcome was associated to a non-negative probability, and these probabilities always add up to 1. OK. OK, so this was the story we started with. Flip a fair coin, and if it's heads, roll a three-sided die. Otherwise, roll a four-sided die. And now, like, if you're you know, seeing this somewhere, there'll probably be an actual problem. Like, what is the probability that the die roll is three or higher? So let me tell you about how to analyze this question. So this is asking you about the probability of something called an event. So here, the event is the die roll being three or higher. And an event is nothing more than a subset of the outcomes. That's like the literal definition. It's a subset of the sample space, any subset. So in our example, uh, it's of size 3. It's the heads 3 outcome, the tails 3 outcome, and the tails 4 outcome. Because these are all the outcomes where the die roll is 3 or higher. OK, and events can also have probabilities. And we just define the probability of an event, S, to be the sum of all the probabilities of the outcomes in that event. OK, so it's a bit of a notation overload, because both outcomes and events have probabilities. And we use the same notation. So often when you have a, an event, you know, you've already got your probability tree, you should kind of like circle the events. Okay? So this event S, the role is 3 or higher. I've circled it here in yellow. It's these three outcomes. Okay, so what is the probability of this event? It's kind of a calculation question. 10 24ths, also known as? Yeah, good. That's right. You're good at arithmetic. This is a challenging one. Well, it's a, it's a sixth plus an eighth plus an eighth, which is 10 24ths or 5 twelfths. OK, you just add up the outcome probabilities. So we kind of like solve the problem. Like this is the probability that the die roll is 3 or higher, 5 twelfths. OK, good. So now that we know how to solve some basic probability problems, actually, we'll go back and look at um, Marais three problems and see what we can say about them. Uh, this one's actually the easiest one. Remember, the first one is, you know, like you're doing coin flips. Alice gets a point for heads. Bob gets a point for tails. Alice is winning 3-2, and then they stop the game. How should they divide up the stake? Um, OK, so the first question here is actually what's fair? And, you know, Pascal and Fermat talked about this. And um, this is not like a, a mathematical statement or a probability statement. This is like a it's a sociological or philosophical statement. They decided that what the fair thing to do would be is take the stake and multiply it by the probability that Alice would win. And that's the money she should take, and Bob should take the, the remaining money, which is the probability that Bob would win times 100 francs. OK, so they just decided that that was the fair thing to do. Seems pretty reasonable. OK, but you know, that raises exactly the question, well, what is the probability that Alice would win if she's winning 3-2? OK, and this is a probability problem, a simple probability problem that we can answer using the techniques we've saw, seen. So let's do that. OK, so Alice is winning 3-2. 
So what happens? Well, the first thing that happens is they you know, flip a coin. The, it's like game number six. So that's Bernoulli a half. And it can come up heads or tails. And if it comes up heads, then Alice wins 4-2. So the game just ends here. And if it comes up tails, then they're tied 3-3. Three, three. So then they flip another coin. That's another Bernoulli a half. And if it comes up heads, then Alice wins 4-3. And if it comes up tails, Bob wins 4-3. So this is the whole, well, this is the start of the probability tree for this uh, probabilistic experiment. Okay, so now the next step is we label the leaves by the outcome. So here the outcome is heads, here it's tails heads, here it's tails tails. You know, notice they don't have the same like length or anything, that's fine. And we write the probabilities of each one underneath. So the probability of this one is half, this one, quarter and a quarter, yeah. So it's a half, and this is a quarter because it's a half times a half, and a half times a half is a quarter. Okay, and now we have this event that we're interested in, the event that Alice wins, and that was these two outcomes, heads and tails heads. So finally, the probability that Alice wins, the probability of this event is the sum of these two outcome probabilities, half plus a quarter is three quarters. Okay, so that's, that's it. It was a pretty easy problem. Alice wins with probability three quarters if she's leading three two. Okay, um, there's a few definitions in this lecture, so we're going to have to get through them. Uh, let's talk about some basic facts and definitions and so forth associated with events and probabilities. And these all follow the ones I'm going to say on this slide. Follow from the fact that the probability of an event is just the sum of the probabilities of the outcomes in that event. So one thing is that if A is a subset of B, these are two events, sort of like A is an event that implies B, then the probability of A is at most the probability of B. That's basically because the probabilities are non-negative and you're only adding up more things on this side. Um, if you have an event A, it's complement, all the outcomes not in A. That's like the concept of like A not happening. And since the probabilities add up to one, the probability of the complement is 1 minus the probability of the event. Um, we also sometimes talk about the event that A or B occurs, which in the set theory terminology is A union B, right? It's all the outcomes where either A occurred or B occurred or both. And uh, this is like the most common uh, tricky uh, issue in the beginning probability. You know, it's not the probability of A plus the probability of B. Of course, if you have a, a set, two sets A and B, and you take their union, um, you know, if you add up everything in A and you add up everything in B, then you've counted everything in the union twice. So you need to subtract all the probabilities inside the intersection. Okay, so probability of A or B is probability of A plus probability of B minus probability of A and B. Okay, and it's a, it's a fallacy to think that it's just the sum of the probabilities, so please do not make this mistake. However, you, what you can say, and this is a surprisingly useful fact, is that the probability of A or B is less than or equal to the probability of A plus the probability of B. Because, well, it's exactly equal to this, and here we've just not taken away something. So that can only make the, the quantity go up. Okay. So let's take a look at the other two problems Mary worked with. The similar one was this one. His game was he'll roll a die four times, and he wins if he gets a one. So you could draw out the probability tree, but it's a little annoying because how many outcomes will there be? Somebody want to put up their hand and say? Yes? Yeah, six to the four, which is pretty large. I guess with enough determination you could draw it, but we won't draw it, but we'll imagine what it looks like. Okay, so it's going to be a, a tree where all the paths have length four and all the nodes inside have branching factor six. And a typical outcome will look like, you know, four, six, one, two. And actually this is an outcome where Marais wins because he did get a one. Let's imagine he does all four rolls even if he's already won on the third roll. Uh, and all the outcomes here will have probability one-sixth to the power of four, right? Because it's one-sixth on all the four branches. Okay, so there's six to the four outcomes. They all have probability one over six to the four. 
Now, let's let w be the event that he wins, that he gets a, at least one one. And uh, we would like to compute the probability of w. And it's actually a little bit tricky. So here's like a little trick that I'll tell you if you're struggling with computing the probability of something. Sometimes it's useful to try to compute the probability of not that thing, probably of the complement of that thing. And then if you can do that, well, you just have to subtract from one to get the answer you're really looking for. So let's try to do this. Let's try to compute the probability that he loses. And what is this as a set? The set of all outcomes where he loses is the set of all outcomes that don't have any ones in them. And how many such outcomes are there? Yeah, there's five to the four because it's all like the strings of length four that use the characters two, three, four, five, six. So there's five to the four. Okay, so the cardinality of this set is five to the four. And so its probability is just, well, you add up one over six to the four, five to the four times. So the probability of him not winning is five to the four over six to the four, which is some quantity. And the probability he lose, wins, therefore, is one minus this. And if you put it into your calculator or whatever, uh, it's 51.8%. So he was actually, I mean, that's why he was making money. This was actually a winning gamble for him. You will win this bet with probability 51.8%. Although he thought it was two thirds, according to some people. Okay. So then, if you remember, he, you know, he took it to the next level when he, the people stopped gambling with him, and he did this experiment where he rolls two dice twenty-four times and wins if he gets double ones. Um, so, can somebody say what the probability of him winning is here? I mean, it's actually trickier than the previous one, and like, you know, if you haven't seen this before, it might take you a little while, but uh, you answered a question already. Anyone else? Well, you can imagine each time he rolls two dice, there are 36 outcomes, right? One, 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 two, one, three, all the way up to six, six. And uh, 25, or sorry, 35 of those are bad for him, right? When he doesn't get double ones. So the probability that in all 24 times he gets not double ones is 35 over 36 to the fourth, to the 24th. So the probability, this is the probability he loses, 35 over 36 to the 24. And so the probability he wins is one minus that. And you know, this is 49.1%. So this is why he was not making money with this gamble. I think he even loses if he does uh, 25. I'm not sure, though. Maybe somebody can check that. Oh, OK. So he would have won. It was very close. It's kind of funny that like, his mistaken calculation was like right on the boundary. <laughs> OK. So next thing I want to talk about is a basic concept in probability, which is tricky. I mean, people have a little bit of trouble with this, so let's try to do it carefully. It's called conditioning. And at a high level, conditioning means revising your opinions of what probability should be based on some new information or partial information. And more precisely, this term partial information literally just means an event. And conditioning on event A is kind of like assuming or promising that the event A occurs. Again, I'll try to go through an example. This is our old uh, game where Mary flipped a coin, heads she rolls a three-sided die, tails she rolls a four-sided die. And we talked about this event, S, the event that she rolled three or higher. And now we're going to talk about conditioning on S. Okay, and that's sort of reasoning about what will happen if somebody promised you that event S happens. Or the way you can think about it is, like, imagine you wrote this code, and like, your friend ran the code and like, you know, traced through it and saw what happened. You didn't watch that, but your friend says to you, like, I promised you, I'm not going to tell you everything that happened, but I promised you event S occurred. And then, you know, maybe your friend asks you, now what do you think about the probability of this or that happening? And this, this partial information would change your opinion of the probabilities. So let's look at this notation. This has got a probability of an outcome, bar, that means conditioned on. An event S. So the way to pronounce this is the probability of outcome H1 conditioned on event S. It's like your friend ran the code, you didn't watch it, 
Your friend said, I promise you event S occurred. And now it's like they're asking you, what do you think is like the probability that heads and one was the outcome? So what would you say? Yeah, zero, right? I mean, if the die roll was higher than three, I mean, you're promised that, then definitely it wasn't heads and one. So this conditional probability is zero. So I'm, I'm going to go through this like an example. I'll give you the definition later, but here I'm trying to kind of get you to guess what the definition should be. OK? If you don't like it, then you can just wait for the actual definition. Um, but yeah. I'm going to write here sort of like the revised probabilities of all the outcomes given that event S occurred. OK, so how about the next one, the probability of heads 2 given that S occurred? You can say it out loud. Zero. Yes, 0, thank you. It's uh, 0. OK, now it, gets a, now it gets interesting. So what do you think is the conditional probability of heads 3 given that S occurred? Somebody said one third. That's a reasonable suggestion. Any other suggestions? What's that? Seven over twenty-four. That's a more sophisticated-sounding suggestion. Um, could be. Any other suggestions? Yes. Four tenths. All right. We have three. This is good. We have three choices: one third, four tenths, or seven over twenty-four. So. Well, let me talk you through what I think the answer should be. Uh, uh, well, I mean, it's here actually we're making a definition, so it can kind of be whatever you want, but um, I'll, I'll, I'll make a suggestion. Um, so the idea here is like, you know, imagine like, um, you know, you did this experiment and like it, it split up the universe into all these different uh, worlds where these different outcomes occurred. Or maybe you can imagine you did the experiment like, a billion times, and like one sixth of the time you got this path, one sixth of the time you got this path, one eighth of the time you got this path, and so forth. But now your friend tells you that you're in this one of these worlds where it came up one of these events, and these kind of constitute one eighth plus one eighth plus one sixth of all the worlds, which I don't know what that is, but well, it's it's something. Um, and now we're considering like no, giving that you know that you're in one of these sort of worlds, you know, how many of them, or what fraction of the time were you in this specific one? So the right definition turns out to be 1 6 divided by, I guess it's 5 twelfths is 1 6 plus 1 8 plus 1 8. Okay, so you look at all the sort of fractional possibility of being in this set, and take from that the fraction that came from this outcome. So the right definition turns out to be 1 6 over 5 twelfths, which is 2 fifths. I think we got that from one person. Um, so it turns out the right definition is that the conditional probability of this outcome is two-fifths. Okay, so it's the outcome's probability divided by the event's probability. So now we can compute the rest of them. This outcome has conditional probability zero, zero, and what should this one be? You don't have to do the arithmetic, you can just tell me. Yeah, it's, I guess it's going to be 3 tenths. It's going to be like 1 eighth divided by the sum of these three numbers, 1 eighth over 5 twelfths, which is 3 tenths. OK, and this one's also 3 tenths. And notice a good thing happened here. If, uh, maybe I should have written this one as 4 tenths. 2 fifths is the same as 4 tenths. You see, now it's, it's good because the conditional probabilities are also non-negative numbers that add up to 1. You know, 4 tenths, 3 tenths, and 3 tenths add up to 1. OK, so it's like a new opinion on the probabilities of all the outcomes, given that S occurred. And it's really like a set of probabilities, just like you had before. So now you could ask some further question, like, suppose I condition on the set S, let A be the event that tails was flipped. You know, what is the probability of A conditioned on S? That's what this A bar S means. What's the probability of A conditioned on S? In other words, like your friend ran the code. And then they say, I'm not going to tell you what happened, but I'll tell you that event S definitely occurred. The roll was three or higher. Now, if you actually look at the trace and say, ah, what's the chance I'm going to see that tails was flipped? What will that be? Well, you just do the exact same process we talked about before. You add up all of the conditional probabilities for the outcomes in that event. There are four outcomes in that event still. This one, this one, this one, and this one. And they add up to 0 plus 0 plus 3 tenths plus 3 tenths, which is 3 fifths. 
Okay, so this is like a little problem that we solved. Given that she got at least a three, what was the chance that it was because she flipped tails? It's three-fifths. That's not something that you could sort of easily guess by looking at the experiment, but on the other hand, if you like do this simulation yourself, you'll find empirically that this is the, the solution. Okay, so let's make the definitions a bit more formal. Um, Let's say you're given an experiment and let A be any event, and there's always this annoying technicality. You have to assume that A does not have zero probability, which is usually pretty easy to assume because you rarely care about things that happen with probability zero. Uh, the conditional probability of an outcome L, a leaf L, is written like this, and it follows the formula I, I sketched before. If L is not in the outcome, or sorry, L is not in the event A, then the probability is zero. And if it is in the outcome A, the conditional probability is the old outcome probability divided by the probability of the event. Okay, and this is why A is not allowed to have probability zero, because then you would have division by zero. Okay, so if we take this definition, then we can actually compute or get a formula for the probability of an event, B, conditioned on another event, A. And as always, you just sum up these uh, outcome probabilities, conditional probabilities, over all the outcomes L in B. And now you see when you do that, among all the outcomes in B, some of them are also in A. The ones that are also in A, in other words, in B intersect A, uh, have this conditional probability by the formula. And the ones that are not in, also in A have zero probability because of this line of the formula. So overall, we have probability of A in the denominator and in the numerator, we have the sum of all the outcome probabilities, the old ones, for outcomes in B intersect A. So we conclude that this is like a formula. You can remember the probability of B conditioned on A is the probability of B intersect A, or A and B, divided by the probability of A. OK, so this is a good way to try to compute these conditional probabilities. Now. Uh, another thing we can do, and this is called the chain rule, is just uh, take that last formula and clear the denominators, move the denominator to the other side, and you get this formula. It's really just taking this and multiplying it over here. The probability of an and, A and B, or A intersect B, is the probability of A times probability of B given A. And you can remember this formula, or I always remember this formula by telling myself a little story in English. Um, it's not like a proof or anything, but it just helps me remember it. You say to yourself, look, I'm interested in the probability that A and B occur. What's the chance of that? Well, in order for A and B to occur, first A has to occur, and that has probability, probability of A. And then B must also occur, but now it's like given that A occurred or conditioned on A occurring. So the probability of that is probability of B conditioned on A. So this is how I get this. I remember this formula. Yes? Yeah, great point. So um, this thing, I mean, you know, it's symmetric with respect to A and B. I mean, A and B is the same as B and A. Um, it's a bit funny, though, because this doesn't look symmetric. It's not symmetric. But it actually proves that it would, you would get the same result if you did probability of B times probability of A given B. So actually, either one works. And it's, it is like an asymmetric way to kind of compute something that looks symmetric. Um, there's a generalization of this, like if you have, let's say, three events, you want to compute the probability that all three happen. This is the kind of formula. And again, you know, you can tell a little story, like for A, B, and C to all occur, first A has to occur, that's this probability. Then B has to occur, assuming A occurs, that accounts for this probability. And then C has to occur, assuming that A and B occurred, so that accounts for this probability. Again, that's just like a little bit of a story. I mean, to actually prove this, you would just write down the definition of all these, I mean, the formula for all these things, and you would see that you do this multiplication, stuff would cancel out, and you'd get this. OK, any questions about this? We're going to use this to solve a problem at the end of the lecture. OK, in the meantime, let's uh, solve a little problem just to illustrate some of these conditioning things we've seen. Maybe, it's, I don't know, this is kind of like a well-known 
probability problem, so maybe you've seen it before, or maybe not. Um, so that's one of these like silly things. Imagine you have three bags, they're like opaque bags, and inside each bag there's two coins, but like one of them has two silver coins, one of them has two gold coins, and one of them has one silver and one gold coin. Okay, and then let's say Mark picks one of these bags randomly, and then sticks his hand in and also picks a coin out randomly. And let's say he looks at it and it turns out to be gold. And then he says, okay. And then he takes out the other coin from the bag that he chose. And the question is, what is the probability that this other coin is also gold? Okay, I don't know what this corresponds to in reality, but it's, it's a nice like, probability puzzle. Um, any guesses? Somebody like to guess? Yeah, one half is a good guess because you think to yourself, look, you get uh, a gold coin, so you're in one of these two bags, and then like, half the time you're in this double gold coin bag, so you would, you know, get a, the other one would be gold in that case, otherwise uh, silver. So it, one half seems like a reasonable guess. Um, yes? Two thirds. Um, yeah, that's maybe an uh, interesting guess. I mean, one thing you might think is like, you know, if I picked a gold coin, maybe it's more likely that I was actually in this bag because it has more gold coins. So then maybe it's more likely that the other one will have a gold coin. So it's not clear. And you can actually, you know, play this yourself and see what happens. Uh, or it might be better to just write a computer program that like did this a million times and see what it uh, got. Or you can use this to try to gamble with your less savvy friends. Um, so it's a bit tricky, so let's just do a computation and find out what the answer is. So this is how you would solve such a problem. You'd say you start defining events. So you always should define some good events. So I might say let G1 be the event that the first coin chosen is gold. And let G2 be the event that the second coin in the bag is also gold. And what is the problem asking us? This is not mathematical, but it's like deciphering natural language. The problem is really asking us to find probability of G2 conditioned on G1. It's like saying, assume that the first coin was gold, then what's the probability that the other one is gold? OK. Well, the simplest thing to do is we know this formula, probability of a conditional, uh, one event condition on the other, we need to compute the probability of the and or the intersection, and also the probability of the thing we're conditioning on. So what is the probability that the first coin chosen was gold? What do you want to say? No. Yeah, it's one half. I mean, you could draw a tree for this, but let me try to skip that step a little bit and say, I mean, look, basically when you choose a random bag and then a random coin from that bag, it's basically like you're choosing one of the six coins at random. OK, and three of them are gold and three of them are silver, so it's 50-50. It's On the other hand, what's the probability of G1 and G2? Well, actually, what is G1 and G2? G1 intersect G2. It's the event that you chose a gold coin, and then the other coin is also gold. So what's the chance of that? Yeah, it's one third, because it's exactly the same as the event that you chose this bag. Right? That's the only way that like, this event occurs, if and only if you choose this bag. And you chose each of the three bags with equal probability, so it's one third. OK, and we can finally compute, therefore, the probability of the second coin being gold, condition on the first one being gold, is one third over a half, which is actually two thirds. So it's a bit surprising, which is why I chose this example. It really is somehow the case that like, the fact that you, the first coin is gold gives you like, somehow a higher conditional probability that you're coming from this bag rather than from this bag. So. I guess it's something you have to get used to, or you know, I encourage you to like literally try it out, and you'll see that it's true. Any questions? Okay. Um, so now we saw previously there how to actually kind of compute something, and um, there's a few more tricks that you should learn to try to compute probabilities, and one of them goes by the wordy name of law of total probability. And uh, one formulation of it is this. Let's say you have event B, and you're trying to compute its probability. 
And this is a correct formula, which, although it looks complicated, actually often helps you compute the probability of B. It's the probability of A times the probability of B given A, plus the probability of not A times the probability of B given not A. So again, I usually remember this with a little sentence, like saying, regarding this event B, either one of two things can happen. Either A occurs, which has this probability, in which case B occurs with probability B given A, or A doesn't occur, which has probability, probability of A complement, in which case the probability of B occurring is like the probability of B conditioned on not A. Well, again, that's just a sentence. I mean, the real way to prove it is just to write down all the definitions, and you'll see that it's true. So we know, for example, that this first term, probability of A times probability of B conditioned on A, is exactly probability of B and A. And this term is probability of B and complement of A. So if we add up the probabilities, what happens? We're adding up all the outcome probabilities in B intersect A. And we're also adding up all the outcome probabilities in B intersect the complement of A. And that's literally just all the outcomes in B. Because you know, every outcome in B, it's either in A or it's in the complement of A. And you're not counting any one more than one. Or if you want to see a picture, like maybe this is somehow a picture of the sample space and all these dots represent the outcomes. A is a subset of the outcomes. It's an event, maybe this one. A complement is the rest of them. B is some other event, some other subset of the outcomes. Maybe it looks like this. You know, and every outcome in B is either in A, it's in this piece, or it's in A complement, it's this piece. There's a more general version. Uh, which says the following. So let A1 through AN be a partition of the sample space. And that's a set theory term. It means these sets exactly cover up the uh, sample space. So each outcome is in exactly one of the sets. And for any event B, you can say, well, the probability of B is either A1 occurs with this probability, in which case B has conditional probability this, or A2 occurs, so it's probability of A2 times probability of B given A2, et cetera. OK, and the proof is more or less the same. Now, it looks kind of complicated. Like, you know, all you wanted to know is probability of B, and suddenly you have to calculate all these weird probabilities. But like sometimes, believe it or not, it's effective to use this formula. Let me try to give an example. Now, this is like a pedagogically uh, weird example because it's a probability problem that has like a major like trick in it, like a very lucky trick. But I show it to you to illustrate a point. So uh, let's say I roll 101 regular six-sided dice, and I ask, what's the probability that they all add up to a number that's divisible by six? So it's very hard. I mean, you cannot draw the probability tree for this. It would have depths like 101 and six to the 101 uh, outcomes, but there's a big trick. Here's the trick I'll just tell you. The trick is to somehow condition on the sum of the first 100 dice rolls. So there's 101 overall. Condition on the sum you have after rolling 100 of them, when there's only one left. This is a trick you have to think of or see before. So how am I going to do that more properly? I'm going to say let A sub K be the event that the first 100 dice sum up to K. So actually, this is like an awesome step. I'm a very powerful person. I just defined 501 events all in one sentence. Um, but there you go. So I, right, because the 100 dice, I mean, if they're all ones, they would add up to 100. If they're all sixes, they would add up to 600. You know, anything in, pos in between is also possible. So let's literally invent an event for each one of them. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and I went a bit fast over that, but it, it's a very confusing question. So yeah, let me take it up. I mean, so really, when I say I roll 101 regular dice, the first thing you should eventually get in your mind is like a block of code that literally says, you can even imagine it has 101 lines. It says die 1 equals rand in 6, die 2 equals rand in 6, die 3 equals rand in 6. I mean, if you're a little bit more sophisticated, you could have like a loop and an array or something. But let's say you just have 101 lines in your code. 
And the, maybe the last line of your code is a non-random line that says sum equals die 1 plus die 2 plus die 3 plus dot 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 plus die 101. So then really, I mean, this is very helpful for the analysis too, because then each die has its own identity and you roll them in a specific order. And like, that's the best way to think about things. OK, so these partition the sample space because they include everything that could happen and they don't, you know, there's no overlap. I mean, each uh, way you can roll 100 dice leads to exactly one of these events happening. And let B be the event uh, that we care about, that all of the dice, all 101 of them, add up to 6. So imagine like you ran the first 100 lines of that code, and you take stock for a second, and then you're going to run that last line where you roll that last die. Now, here's the main step. I claim that for any one of these AKs, the probability of B conditioned on that AK is exactly 1 sixth, and it doesn't matter what K is. OK, it's really like saying, I don't care what happens. I don't care so much what happens with the first 100 dice. They add up to some number k. Whatever that number k is, let's see what's going to happen with that last die roll. You do the last die roll, the overall sum is going to be either k plus 1, k plus 2, k plus 3, k plus 4, k plus 5, or k plus 6. Each of those six things will have conditional probability 1 sixth. And it's just a simple fact that if you have six numbers in a row, exactly one of them is divisible by 6. You know, if, if you rolled all ones, you had 100, the final roll is going to be, or the final sum will be either 101, 102, 103, 104, 105, 106. And in exactly one of those cases, B occurs, 102. Um, so for every K, each of these conditional probabilities is 1 over 6. So now I'm going to use the law of conditional probability with 501 different events. I'm going to say either A100 occurs, it has some probability, in which case B occurs with probability, probability of B given A100 plus etc. And you should now resist the temptation to compute these probabilities of the AKs, because we have this kind of lucky, very lucky fact that all these conditional probabilities are one sixth. So it's just probability of A100 times a sixth plus probability of 101 times one sixth plus up to probability of getting 600 times 1 sixth. Now we factor out the 1 sixth, so we get 1 sixth times the probability of A100, A101, et cetera, up to A600. And these probabilities, we don't know what they are, but they add up to 1, right? Because you know every outcome is counted exactly once here. You're going to get exactly one of these numbers. So this adds up to 1, and the, answer is, the final answer is 1 sixth. Uh, any questions about this? So it's kind of to illustrate a use of this formula. As I said, this is kind of like an amazingly lucky trick that the problem is just set up so that this trick exactly works. And it's not such a great trick in general. Um, for example, suppose I ask you, I roll 101 regular dice. What is the probability that their sum is divisible by 5? Does anybody have a guess? So guess what it might approximately be? No guesses? Pardon me? One thirtieth. Um, it's a bit higher than that. I mean, there's some. Well, I'll. I mean, I'll tell you. Yeah, you have a guess? About one fifth. That's correct. It's about one fifth. But it's unlike the previous case. It's not exactly one fifth. Uh, I figured this out. This is the answer. <laughs> and it's actually not so easy to compute that. I mean, it's not like I, you know, wrote down the probability tree. It's not even that I figured out how many different outcomes are there where the sum is divisible by fifth, five. It's a little tricky. Uh, I don't know if you can see that, but it's 0 0.200001, which is indeed about one fifth, but it's a little bit bigger. And uh, you need a much trickier trick to solve this one. I solved this one using linear algebra, although there's other methods. But uh, we'll talk about that in a later lecture. OK. Uh, I have to tell you about one more 
um, probability concept, which is also a little tricky. It's called independence. Okay, here's the official definition of independence, which you'll see if you open up a math textbook. I do not like this definition so much, but this is the definition. Uh, a and B are independent if probability of A and B is the product probability of A, probability of B. Now, the reason I don't like it is this is, this is like in your mind the real definition of independence. The real definition is basically A and B are independent if probability of A given B is the same as probability of A. That corresponds to like your mental model, right? It's like saying, it doesn't matter whether or not B happens, the probability of A stays the same whether or not you know anything about if B happens. And symmetrically, it's like it's equivalent to either one of these. Uh, like the probability of B given A is the same as the probability of B. The only reason textbooks don't write this is because then you have to say, well, technically this is not the correct definition because what if A or B has probability zero? Then you're not actually allowed to condition on it. So what they do is they like write the definition, this is probability of A and B divided by probability of B, and they like multiply it out and get this equivalent thing, except here there's no conditioning, so you don't have to say anything about like, oh, except if you're dividing by zero. But again, it's very rare or pointless to care about probability zero events, so I usually think about this as the definition, although I guess this is the real definition. Now, there's another funny thing about this definition, which I also find very annoying, and um, it's something that when they teach you about probability in like a math class, they never tell you, and it's very confusing, but I'm here to tell it to you. There's like a secret, which I will now reveal to you about independence. That those other folks will not tell you. So here's a question that illustrates this weird situation. It's a very simple problem. Let's say I flip two coins. Let A be the event that the first flip is heads. Let B be the event that the number of heads in total out of two is even. And now suppose the question says, are A and B independent? Well, a normal human would say, doesn't look like it, right? Because they seem to like both, for example, depend on the outcome of the first flip. You know, I mean, certainly A depends on that. And B also, I mean, it depends if you're counting if there's an even number of heads or not, whether the first one was heads or tails. But, you know, if you're like, whatever, I'll do the, the question, uh, and just appeal straight to the definition, turns out the answer is yes. Because the probability of the first flip being heads is a half. The probability of getting an even number of heads is also a half, because it's either heads, heads, or tails, tails, out of the four possibilities. And the probability of A and B is getting an even number of heads and the first one being heads is also, is a quarter because it's, it occurs only if it's heads, heads. So then you're like, oh, they're independent if like half times a half equals a quarter, which is true. Yeah? Isn't this like the 101 dice problem? It's like flipping some number of two-sided dice and seeing if it's divisible by two. Uh, yeah, that's, I mean, uh, that's uh, regarding B. Yeah, it's the exact instance of the, I mean, you could compute B's probability that way. It's a half. It's for sort of the same reason that it was a sixth for the dice. But here you can just draw the whole tree, for example. So technically, the answer to this question is yes. However, in some sense, like, the real answer to this question is like, this is a stupid question, and why did you ask it? Because, like, what's the point, right? You manage to calculate these three probabilities, and then you multiply two of them together, and you're like, hey, it equals the third one. Like, hooray, I guess that means they're independent. And um, this is not the way any actual person uses or thinks about independence. But it makes for, like, a very tricky problem, I guess. Uh, and this is the secret that nobody ever tells you, but I'm telling it to you. I call it the principle of independence, and it's like this. Let's say you have a block of randomized codes, and it has two parts to it. So like maybe these are lines of code, and this is the first part, and there could be some other stuff, this is the second part. And suppose A is an event that only depends on the first part, like whether or not A occurs, you can tell just by seeing what happened with this block of code. And B, you can tell whether it occurred by only looking at what happened with this block of code. And suppose you can prove, just in the general way that we prove things by logical sound reasoning, that the two parts of code like, do not, cannot affect one another. Like, they don't interact, you could run them in the opposite order, it wouldn't change the behavior of the program. Then you may conclude that A and B are independent. And actually you can try to prove that if you want, why it's a valid conclusion by thinking about probability trees, but anyway, you, you may conclude that A and B are independent. And you may therefore deduce this formula that probability of A given B equals the probability of A. I mean, usually in, in, in math, you can't 
tell A and B are independent unless you've already proved this. But then what actually happens is you somehow reason, I mean, what really happens is you use this principle to reason that A and B are independent. And then you use this formula to help you calculate something. Um, okay, I have to tell you one last thing about independence. This is, I told you about independence of two events. Now I'm going to talk about independence of multiple events. Yeah? Yes, I have a question about guidance. Yeah. So what is uh, the guidance method? That is, you have a point six probably getting, uh, getting head and a point four for getting tails. Yeah. Uh, then are they still independent? No, I think they're only independent if the coin comes up heads with probability half or maybe one or zero. So that's another, like, it's like a weird fluke that these two numbers multiplied to it, the same, this third number. Um, yeah, so somehow it's like a technicality that they're independent. Which, in general, if they had, were weighted coins, they wouldn't be. Okay, quickly, independence of multiple events. Uh, you say that, I'll do the, illustrate the definition when there's five of them. You'll see the general case. So if I have five events, I'll say that they're independent if, well, this is the first thing you might guess. The probability of all of them happening is the product of the probability. So that would be the natural generalization based on what we saw for two events. But it's not just this. You need this. You also need this. Like probability of the first four happening is the probability, the product of the probabilities of the first four. And you also need that like the probability that number one, number three, and number five all happen is the product of the probabilities of these three events. And in general, you need it for like every subset. So it's a very hard condition seemingly to check. For every subset S of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, you need to say that they're independent, that the probability of the and of just the A's corresponding to that set is equal to the product of the associated probabilities. Um, yeah, so it's a very hard definition to check. But again, um, there's a similar secret principle of independence that holds for multiple events. It's the same thing you'd imagine, like if you have five blocks of code and like the ith block is all that you need to know in order to determine if AI occurs, and if you can prove that these blocks of code cannot affect each other at all, then you may deduce that A1 through A5 are independent. And then you can use this formula to help you compute things. And in fact, it's not only that you can use this formula, it's a fact, which I won't prove, it's actually slightly annoying, but um, not only are these things true if they're independent, but anything that looks like this that you would expect to be true based on the phrase they're independent is true. So like if I ask you, if you know that they're independent and I say what's the probability of A1 conditioned on the fact that either A2 or A3 occurred and either A5 or not A4 occurred, right, you would mentally say to yourself, well look, if A1 through A5 are all independent, like all this baloney about A2 through A5 shouldn't affect the probability, A1's probability. And that's correct. So, I mean, if they're independent, then it's a consequence that stuff like this holds. Yeah? These independence definitions, they're, they're if and only if, right? Yeah, yeah. When you see a definition, it's really, even though it says if, it kind of means if and only if. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, for the last 15 minutes, I want to tell you about a very well-known probability problem called the birthday problem. Again, you might have seen it before, but... It could be a little bit new. Uh, there's two famous probability problems, the birthday problem and this Monty Hall problem. The Monty Hall problem I hate, and I'm not going to bring it up because <laughs> the main tricky aspect is the stage of going from the English language description to the code. And like that's the part we don't care about. That's not math, right? That's like philosophy and natural language interpretation. Like once you get to the code, it's like as easy as that silver and gold thing. It's, so yeah. So the birthday problem is what we'll talk about. <laughs> Uh, okay, here's the birthday problem question. Let's imagine you have M students in a room, and uh, let's assume M is at most 365. What's the probability they all have different birthdays? Now this also is like just an English language question, and there's some issues in translating it into a proper mathematical question. For example, we're going to ignore the existence of February 29th, and we're going to assume that birthdays, all the birthdays are equally likely, which is slightly not true in real life, and assume that there's no twins in the class, etc. Um, so really, long story short, I mean this. When I say this, this is what I mean. You do this randomized code for i equals 1 to 5. The i student's birthday is set to be a random number between 1 and 365. 
Okay, and then we want to know what's the probability that everybody's birthday is different. I have like the greatest anecdote in the world about the time I was teaching 359 probability and computing and like the birthday problem in February 29th. It literally takes five minutes to tell and we don't have those five minutes, so I will save it for another day. It's, yeah, okay. Uh, okay, so let's try to solve this problem. What is the probability that everybody gets a different birthday? Okay. <clears throat> So again, this one takes some thought, and I'm going to go through the solution fairly quickly. I mean, I'm going to go sort of straight to it using the clever ideas. And the main clever idea is to define this, these events, these M events. I define them all with one sentence. I'll say, let AI be the event that the student's I's birthday differs from the birthday of all the previous students. Okay, so I'm really imagining, imagine like you go through this iteration, and you know, on the I'th iteration, the I student gets a new birthday, and AI is the event that it's different from like all the birthdays chosen so far, or like all the students that you've like gone through so far. Okay, so this is going to be key for analyzing the problem. And let D be the event that we really care about, the event that everybody's birthday is different. So, Here's an important question. How can you describe D, set theoretically, in terms of these events AI that I defined? Uh, let's let people think for a second. How can you def define the event that all the birthdays are different in terms of these events? Okay, I'll take whoever was going to answer it up here. Yeah? Yeah, it's the and of all of them. Because imagine, like, you wanted to check that, like, all the birthdays were different. Like, okay, you assign the first birthday, and you're like, okay, this better be different from all the other birthdays, of which there are none, but that's A1. And when you assign the second birthday, it should be different from all the previously assigned ones. And when you assign the third birthday, it should be different from all the previous ones, and so forth. And furthermore, indeed, if all these events happen, like everybody's new birthday, newly assigned birthday was different from all the previous ones, then it is correct that all the birthdays are different. Okay, so D is exactly this and. Yeah, actually on the subject of the and, was anybody here born on February 29th? Okay, well it was a long shot. It happened once to me in a much smaller class. Um, Okay, so this is the event that we want to reason about. And now we're actually going to use this chain rule that we talked about way back in the beginning. We care about the probability of A1 and A2 and A3, etc. And it's equal to this formula. And again, you remember it by saying, well, what's the probability that all of these occur? First, A1 has to occur, which has this probability, probability of A1. Then A2 has to occur given A1, and then A3 has to occur given A1 and A2, and then A4 has to occur given A1, A2, A3. Okay. It's kind of like saying, like, okay, let's say you've gone like so many steps through the loop, and so far it's happened that everybody's had a different birthday from what came before. What's the chance that the i, like the next person, will also have a different birthday? Okay, so what is in general, I mean, we have to calculate all these terms, what is the probability of AI conditioned on all the previous A's happening? Well, the way to think about it is this. What is this event, A1 and A2 and A3, up to AI minus 1? It means that the first I minus 1 students all had different birthdays. Right? It's like the event that up to the i minus 1 time, you had all distinct birthdays. And now we're interested, what's the chance that this next i-th person, when they get their random birthday assigned, um, differs from all those birthdays? So you see at this point, I mean, maybe you see it. At this point, sort of i minus 1 out of 365 different birthdays are kind of occupied. I mean, assuming this occurs, you have i minus 1 people, they all have some different birthdays throughout the year. And now, you're choosing one more birthday at random. So the probability that it's different from all these previous ones is it would have to go into one of the unoccupied sort of slots. It would have to have a birthday that's different from these i minus 1s. 
So each one gets chosen with the same probability, 1 over 365, and this is the number of ones that are different from all the previous ones. So it's exactly 1 minus i minus 1 over 365. Does that make sense? Okay, so if you plug that in to this formula, well, also you have to figure out probability of A1. What is that? Yes, yeah, the probability that the first person's birthday is different from every, everybody's, uh, every previous person's birthday. Well, that's always the case. So it's 1 times 1 minus 1 over 365 times 1 minus 2 over 365 times dot, 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 1 minus m minus 1 over 365. So, so far we've computed the probability that everybody has a different birthday is this number, which, you know, if m is like 50 or something, this is some number. And actually, that's it. That's the final answer. <laughs> Looks like a bad punchline, actually. Um, but that's it. I mean, if m is any number, you can just, you know, have your computer calculate this number, and that's the probability. Okay, well, uh, why is this interesting? <clears throat> well, this is the probability all the students have different birthdays. Let me just look at the complement event, which is, oh, sorry, let me just graph this. Now, it's hard to see this graph, but this is an m on this horizontal axis. And this is the probability, actually it's like the log plot of the probability. So this is like 0, this is 10 to the minus 20, 10 to the minus 40, 10 to the minus 60. And you see that even for pretty small numbers, like the probability that they're all different is like getting into like the 10 to the minus 20 range, which is unimaginably small. It's like never going to happen, basically. And this is a bit counterintuitive. Like if you see, you know, if there's, I don't know, what's a good spot here? If there's like 150 people, the probability that they all have different birthdays is like 10 to the minus 18 or something. Okay, and you know, you might think that's a little bit surprising. Or to put it another way, let's just look at the complement. Let's say you have M students, you want to know what's the probability that their birthdays are not all different, that there's at least two people with the same birthday. Well, it's just one minus this. And again, I'll plot this. Maybe this is a little easier to think about. This is again M on this axis, and this is the probability that two students have the same birthday. And it goes up pretty fast. You see, already, even once it's like, 60 or so, I mean, you look at the plot, it's basically one. It's like saying once you have 60 people in a class, almost surely two people have the same birthday. And that's a little bit weird. Like, if you didn't know anything about probability, if you were like Mireille, you might think, I don't know, maybe you would need like 180 students or like 365 students before you, there's a reasonable chance that two have the same birthday. But no, it's like 60. And in fact, if you, let's say you want to make it like a fair bet, or you like want to know when's the break-even point for when it's 50-50, you do this little calculation, it's very close to 23. So again, as soon as you have 23 students in a room, the chance that two of them have the same birthday is about 50-50. And that's why the birthday problem is sometimes called the birthday paradox. I mean, it's a calculation. It's just the fact that this 23 seems surprisingly small. Any questions? Yeah. Three hundred sixty-five choose m divided by three hundred sixty-five to the power of m. Um, well, what do people think? Is that also the correct probability of uh, m people having different birthdays? Yeah, it is. That's right. I mean, you imagine a probability tree that would have all the outcomes would have probability like three hundred sixty-five to the power of m, 1 over that, and there would be 365 choose m different branches, I think. Is, I'm awesome. Isn't that a factor of m factor? You take whatever you set down and m factor you because you, you actually need permutation to be the key power. Ah, yeah, yeah, that's right. You would want 365, that's right, because you care about the order of the students in this code. Yeah. Well, thank you. Um, yeah, and then if you write that out, 365 choose m and convert to factorials and multiply by m factorials, you'll get like this descending 365 times 364 times 363 in the denominator. This is like a different way to do the calculation. We'll have 365 times 365 times 365, and you'll get this um, 
sequence of factors like 1 minus i minus 1 over 365 that we saw. Okay, now whenever you have this birthday problem, it's very traditional to actually test it out. However, there are many more people than 23 in this classroom. And so it, this, it's pointless to test it out because like I guarantee it will, two people will have the same birthday. Uh, I mean, how do you actually normally do it in practice, right? You go through all the students one by one and you have them say their birthday out loud. And then everybody's listening, and if you hear your own birthday, you like put up your hand and say, we have the same birthday. But like, I'm not going to do that because it's, it's, guaranteed, I mean, it's guaranteed to work. In fact, I don't know how many people we have, but I think it's almost enough that there's a pretty good chance it'll happen even after the first person. Like, I'll ask this person to say her birthday, and like already somebody will say, that's my birthday. And if it doesn't happen there, like, I'm sure by the time we finish the first row, it, it, we would get a match. In fact, I don't really, you really have to ask her birthday because she's just going to say, you know, some random day between 100 and 365, and I'm predicting that there's a decent chance that somebody will already have that as their birthday. So it doesn't really have to be her birthday, it could just be any day at all, and I would kind of think there's a reasonable chance that somebody would have that already as their birthday. So for example, that day could also be today. So is it anybody's birthday today? Put up your hand. For real? All right, very good. <laughs> I brought you a cupcake. <laughs> What's your name? Uh, Charles. Charles, all right, happy birthday. <laughs> there could have been more than one. So is anybody's birthday tomorrow? That's the, that would be terrible, because that's like the day of the midterm. <laughs> Wait, is it really? Somebody's birthday tomorrow? He's to no? <laughs> Nothing. Uh, all right. Anybody's birthday yesterday? No? All right. Well, the last cupcake is for me then. <laughs> Happy birthday, Charles. Uh, let me say one more thing. We still have like one minute. Uh, what if there are n possible birthdays? Uh, you do the same calculation. The probability that two people will share a birthday is the same thing, but n instead of 365. And you may now ask yourself, for what value of m is this about a half? And uh, it's an annoying question. It, you need a little bit of calculus, maybe. I'll just tell you. It's about square root n. And that's um, sort of another aspect of the birthday paradox. It's a bit surprising. If you're picking m square root random, sorry, if you're picking about square root n random numbers between 1 and n, there's a 50 50 chance or so that two of them will be the same. Um, and actually, this is sometimes not called the birthday paradox in theoretical computer science. It's called the birthday attack in theoretical cryptography. And uh, I'm out of time, so I will skip this section. But you can look at the slides and see why it's called the birthday attack. Whoa. <laughs> well, I guess we should really end here. So uh, I don't know how I did this. Uh, check out the slides for this last story. Try not to get epilepsy. And I will see you tomorrow at the midterm.